everyone, if you missed my master bathroom reveal, the video where I basically vlogged the process and then showed you the finished result of our master bathroom, I guess it's a renovation. It wasn't like a full on, full renovation, but if you wanna see that, I will link it up there and down in the description box. And at the end of that video, I asked you to leave questions that you had about the process, about it being the finishes, the fixtures, so forth and so on. And I also threw out some questions on Instagram and got some there as well. Hey everyone, it is editing me. I just wanna remind you that today officially kicks off the Memorial Day weekend sales of which there are many, many, many. This video is already too long. So I have listed them on my blog and I will list some of the really big ones down in the description box. Happy shopping, happy Memorial Day weekend and the official launch of summer. Let's get back to the video. We need to talk about the fact that I redid half of the bathroom probably close to 10 years ago. At the time, we replaced the tile floors in our bathroom. We redid the tile surround around the bathtub and we redid the full shower enclosure, replaced the glass doors with frameless glass shower doors, re removed the fiberglass floor and added river rock type tile flooring to the bottom, the tile around the surround and new shower fixtures and new bathtub fixtures as well. So that was phase one of our remodel. And then you fast forward almost a decade. I didn't realize so much time had passed and then we did stage two. And I'll get into why we separated it out like that as we're talking about the planning. So the biggest question was, where do you start? I think there's no right answer to that. Obviously you have to have a plan in mind. Like what do you wanna do with your bathroom? Does it just need some paint? Do you wanna strip it down to the studs? What is it that you have in mind for this remodel? So in our case, we had some very specific ideas and I'm gonna stick with this most current remodel just to keep things in kind of a neat little box here. So when you first start, obviously have the scope of the project in mind that you would like and then I would suggest that you research the materials and on your own research the costs. So in our head, we really didn't know what to budget for because we had no idea how much countertops would cost. So what we did is before we approached a contractor or a designer, we wanted to get an idea of what kind of cost we're looking at. And I highly recommend, even if you know exactly the designer or contractor that you wanna work with, don't wait for them to give you the answers. Something that I learned from being married to an attorney is you never ask a question you don't already know the answer to. That really just applies, I think, to cross-examinations. But in this case, you wanna be able to know ballpark numbers of what things cost for your project so you can decide if the contractors, designers that you're interviewing are giving you good bids. I mean, how do you know you're not getting ripped off? How do you know they're giving you such a ridiculously no low number that you should be concerned about the quality of their work or the quality of the materials? So go out on your own and get some ideas of what things will cost. We went to a bunch of different stone yards, we looked at different materials. Now I knew I wanted a marble look or a white bathroom look. So initially I thought marble, but I know that marble is very porous. It's not particularly recommended in bathrooms, but I wanted that marble look. We looked at quartzite, we looked at quartz. I get them mixed up um, as to which one is which because they have more white options than granite does. They're both very expensive. I didn't quite like the look of it. And as we were going from stone yard to stone yard, a handful of the places suggested we consider dolomite. That was another thing I got a lot of questions on. What, why did you pick dolomite? So none of these are inexpensive options. Let me be very clear. But dolomite looks very much like marble. I think it might actually technically be a form of marble. It's not the exact same chemical composition, but it is much more durable and it is much less expensive than marble. So in my case, I got the exact look that I was looking for, slightly less expensive, and actually a better product for where I wanted to place it. On top of that, we decided to pay a little bit extra for a sealer that's called Bulletproof Sealant. That's applied after the countertop is installed, which makes your countertop pretty much bulletproof. Although I wouldn't start throwing red wine on my countertop and leave it and see what happens. We went around all these different stone yards. We got estimates. We did measure ourselves to get just general ballpark ideas of we have this much linear feet, this much square footage of countertop we're looking to replace. What is that gonna cost? Because if they had come back 
with a number that was just way more than we could afford, it's not the end of the world. It's just that, okay, that's how much we need to save up for before we move forward with our project. Another advantage to going to a lot of the sources on your own is also ask them for recommendations for contractors, subcontractors, in this case, um, fabricators for countertops. And the same names kept coming up over and over, especially people recommending one specific person in San Antonio who's really good with Dolomite. That way, you know, if, if these people see everyone, they see tons of contractors and um, skilled people coming through working on these types of projects. And if they're getting good feedback or bad feedback about the same people and over and over, they are a fabulous resource. So initially our project was just to replace the countertop. From there, I decided to go with a contractor. I can give you pros and cons for working with contractors. You have to know yourself and what works for you. I have realized through this process that I am very much a type A control freak kind of person and I don't like handing it over to the contractor. I personally have found that I do know enough to coordinate these things on my own now. Um, I'm not saying working with a contractor is bad. There are definite advantages to working with contractors and designers who handle everything for you as far as arranging for the, people, the different people to come into your home and the time frame and, and sourcing all the materials. That, for a lot of people, is a huge reason why you wanna go with a contractor. I have learned about myself that I prefer having more control over those things and I'm probably not an ideal client either. I think I probably ask too many questions, want to know what's going on, want firm answers. Contractors aren't always able to give you those things, so I'm probably not the ideal client. I would say no matter what the scope of your project is, get estimates, individual line item estimates for every part of a possible remodel. Let's say you have a $5,000 budget and it's gonna cost you $20,000 to do everything you want. Well, maybe you could do it in phases. Maybe you can pick certain things that will hit that $5,000 mark and make the room look good enough and it won't leave it in disarray and then you save up for the next phase and you, it doesn't, there's no rule that says you have to gut a room and to the studs and completely renovate it. You can do things in stages. There's no shame in wanting to pay cash, not wanting to take out a home equity loan, saving up money, planning. Sometimes it might take a decade, that's okay. I think it was worth the wait. I personally feel a lot better at night knowing I don't have any outstanding debt on anything that we just did in that room. So with this particular project, it really was just gonna be replacing the countertop. Then we hired our contractor, and as he was walking us through the project, he said, I just wanna know, are you good with your cabinets? Because once we replace that countertop, you're not gonna be able to replace the countertops. So Michael and I talked about it, and we thought, okay, let's price out everything else that we're thinking about doing in this room, and let's see where we are. So. Something we knew, if we're ripping out the countertop, that's going to affect the wall a little bit, so is this the time to pull the mirrors off the wall? So I personally have always wanted to replace those mirrors with the framed mirrors that you see now. So that was something. Another thing was to get that nice clean framed look, I knew we were gonna have to move our light fixtures up higher than they currently were because initially they were coming out of the mirror, so to speak. So we were gonna have to move them up Doing all that would probably, well, did entail repairing some drywall, retexturizing, repainting, and so forth. So everything is starting to add up. And when you replace a countertop, you also have to replace the sinks. That's generally a good time to order new fixtures. You know, everything starts piling on. So it's really good to get the full estimate of everything individually itemized out so you know all the costs. Then you can sit down and make some rational decisions. So at one point we thought, okay, this is adding up to be way more than we initially thought. What if we only did the countertops and the cabinets at this point, wait a little bit, save up a little more money, and then go for the up part, you know, the mirrors, move the light fixtures and repaint that side of the room. We looked at all the costs and what our savings looked like and what other expenses we had coming up and realized that it was in our budget to do the whole thing at once. Contractor questions, things to ask. Well, first of all, definitely see if you can get recommendations from word of mouth from people who have actually used your contractor. Like I said, going to the different stone yards and, and the different sources of materials, you'll get a lot of recommendations that way. If you settle on a couple, never just go with one person, get competing bids 
ask to see proof, you know, are they insured and bonded, ask to see proof of that. Not just the insurance certificate, take down the information, call the insurance company and confirm that their insurance is active because anybody can just print out that certificate and then cancel their policy and lie and say, oh yeah, sure, I'm, you know, sure I'm bonded, sure I'm insured. Get that information, confirm for yourself. Go online, Google their name, Google the individual owner's name, Google the name of the, of the company, see if anything pops up, check your Better, Better Business Bureau, check with your state attorney general's office online. You can search to see if any complaints have been filed. Just because somebody filed a complaint against them doesn't mean they're bad people. I mean, disgruntled homeowners can come up with any excuse to file a claim, but do your due diligence. Also ask about a mechanics lien. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing, but just ask the contractor if they are going to take a mechanics lien out on your home. I don't want to get into too much of what that actually is. My recommendation is to Google it. If I got Michael on here, it would be another 30 minute video explaining what that is, but look into that because you may or may not want that taken out against your home. We personally did not. Another thing to ask the contractor, are the subs, the subcontractors, are they in-house? Are they part of his or her team? Or does he use different sources for the different work? For instance, does he have in-house his own fabricator, his own cabinet installers, his own electrician, his own plumber, his own tile guy, his own painter, or is he sourcing out for all those things as well? Does his insurance cover those subcontractors or do the subcontractors then need to prove that they have their own insurance before they set foot in your house? Because you really don't want anybody setting foot in your house that isn't covered by insurance unless you're comfortable having your homeowner's insurance deal with any accidents or things that go wrong in your house. This is the not fun part of the house remodeling. One of the things about having a contractor that doesn't have his own subs is that can really drag the project out because he can't coordinate everything in house. He is at the whims of all the people that he's trying to coordinate. So for instance, um, he gets the, the demo guys in and they rip everything off the wall, but does he have the next guy lined up to you know start doing the install or the painter guy or now you have to wait a week because your fabric his fabricator that he wanted to use went out of town just like all of that stuff so it's just something to ask about i'm not saying anything is negative but it's going to be a frustrating process at some point you're not going to enjoy this process you're going to be annoyed with your contractor or the subcontractors or just something about the project it's going to happen so the more information you can have ahead of time so that you understand what to expect, the less likely, the less frustrated you will be. Okay, while you're talking to your contractor and they've presented you with a bid, a few of you asked, should we prepare to be to go over budget? Yes. But that doesn't mean they can just throw random numbers at you in the middle of a project and suddenly it's double what they said it was going to be. When they give you your bid, go over every single bit of it and you ask them, is this a fixed line item or is there a reason that this number could change? What would cause this number to change? What is the high end of the estimate? For example, we had a certain charge to install the new plumbing fixtures, but if it turned out that from ripping the cabinets out and removing the original plumbing that our valves underneath, this is plumbing, if the, if the valves ended up being replaced, that was going to add another, I don't know, $200 to the bid. We're like, okay, $200 we can handle. However, something that was big was because our counter space is huge, we needed for sure one slab of dolomite or one slab of granite, one slab, one big piece of rock, a whole slab. But our fabricator was really clear. He wasn't entirely sure that that would be enough. It was a possibility we would need a second slab. And so we wanted to know worst case scenario, what would that cost before we decided to go forward? Is that something we could afford if it ended up going over that budget? Luckily, yes, we could, and no, we didn't need a second slab. Another thing was when they ripped the mirrors off the wall, what was the wall gonna look like behind it? You don't know. So best case scenario, doesn't need any drywall, maybe a little bit of patching, throw some paint on it and move on. But worst case scenario, chunks of wall come off, they need to get their drywall guys, sheetrock possibly, and then paint, that adds to the cost of the project. Well, what will that cost be? So I hammered him down every single bit, every single line item, what is a fixed cost, what isn't, and worst case scenario. So then you kind of have an idea, and then you get it in writing, and then you have him sign off on it. 
really important whether you're working with a contractor or a designer you're working with individual subcontractors that you're organizing yourself set up clear expectations with the people that you're working with from the very beginning it doesn't mean it will avoid uncomfortable situations or confusion but it does really go a long way like if you expect your contractor to be there on certain install days ahead of time like i want you here when the countertops are installed i want you here when they put in the light fixtures. It doesn't matter if you're here or not when they're painting. I can, I can oversee that. Just things like that so they know what you expect of them. Or maybe you're someone who wants a lot of communication. You need to let them know. I need to have a text the night before letting me know what time you're gonna get there. I need to know two days in advance, three days in advance, a week in advance when you have people lined up. Because I work out of my house, I needed to know when people were and weren't gonna be here. I didn't care if they worked every single day of the week, but I needed to know what time they're coming, generally what time they're leaving, so that I could accommodate my schedule and make sure that I could get my work done when they weren't here. Because obviously I can't film like this if there's people hammering and sawing and making noise in the house. So just things like that. Or maybe you work out of the house and you're not comfortable having people in your home when you're not there, so you need time to coordinate having people there. Or you have dogs and you wanna put them in um, doggy daycare. You know, whatever the logistics are, I personally think it's just, you shouldn't have to ask for the contractor to give you a heads up more than a few hours ahead of time of when people are scheduled to come in your home, but communicate those expectations. It's always a good thing. Another question I got was how long did it take? Well, it's not a straight answer. So we started the planning process, I'd say early December is when we started talking to our contractor and I'm filming this on May 25th and it isn't 100% done actually. There's a couple things on the punch list that need to be fixed, but for all intents and purposes, it was done around mid-May. Now, did it really need to take six months? No, some of that was our fault. Like I said, we started adding things to the project. It initially started as just a countertop replacement and went to a lot more. Some of that was due to the cabinets took a long time to come in. We were told it was gonna take a couple of weeks. It was more like a month. COVID, I really don't think had any impact on the length of time. I live in Texas, we're pretty, we've are pretty. we been open pretty much since last year. Um, it, it, nobody got sick and couldn't come. So I don't think that was a factor necessarily. It may have been a factor in the cabinet manufacturing, but I'm not, I don't think it did. Some of that was because our contractor did not have his own in-house subcontractor, so he was at the mercy of all the other subcontractors that he was working with and their time frame. and since they didn't work for him, they didn't, I don't think they felt like they needed to be in a rush to get the work done necessarily. So it's something to think about. If you choose to work with a contractor who doesn't have their own subs, it could add time to the project. As far as the actual from demo to finish, I think he demoed in late March or early April. Watch the vlog, I should go back and watch because it has all the dates on there. And there was a couple delays, like I said, um, the wrong drawer was delivered and so we had to wait like three weeks for the new drawer to be replaced and we couldn't install the countertop until whatever. Assume it's going to take longer than they tell you. And the reason you need to know how long it's gonna take is in addition to budget, plan what you're gonna do not having that room available to you, whether it's your bathroom or your family room or your kitchen, have a contingency plan. For me, it wasn't the end of the world. We have four bathrooms in this house and the good news is in only doing half the bathroom, we could still use the toilet, we could still use the tub and the shower. I used a guest bathroom upstairs. I moved all my makeup stuff to a desk that we have upstairs in the game room. Michael took over the um, guest bath on the first floor. It was not an inconvenience. I just had to walk upstairs. But for some people, maybe you only have one bathroom, that could be a big deal. So obviously you have to plan for those kinds of things. A couple questions I got were about the scheduling. Did I have people here every day? Unfortunately, no. There was like one or two days of hurried activity and then there would be quite a bit of downtime and then there would be a few more days of activity and then more downtime. I found that incredibly frustrating. If you don't have a personally personality type like mine, you'll probably be fine. It made me nuts. Another common question was, where do you cut corners? What's worth splurging on? I don't wanna tell you this is what you need to do, but I can tell you what we chose. So I felt like it was important to spend the money on the countertops because that is a big feature. I don't 
know what Rowdy's doing. And it's sort of the showpiece of the room and we knew they were gonna be expensive. Did I, but at the same time, I saved on that a little bit. I didn't go to the highest end quartz or quartzite, which would have cost more. I found something a little more budget friendly. I wouldn't say budget friendly, but more budget friendly than the high end stuff. Cause so even in those big ticket items, there's definitely wiggle room. The areas where I personally think you can save. Now remember, I'm not going for a Pinterest look. I am not a high end person. Clearly I'm talking to you wearing an Amazon dress, but I didn't think it was worth the money to spend on light fixtures. I ordered mine from, I think it was either Home Depot or Lowe's. I feel like there was a lot of great selections there. Faucets. Faucets I decided to splurge on, and I'll tell you why. Now, my faucets are from Moen, and you're gonna think, well, they carry that at Home Depot and Lowe's. Yes, they do. But the Moen and, or Delta or Kohler fixtures that they carry in the stores, are not the same quality as what the contractors and designers can get. The pieces are not the same. There's more plastic pieces inside the ones from the big box stores that are available to the general public, whereas the ones that are available to commercial vendors are a higher quality on the inside. And I would rather pay a little bit more to, have, to get the good stuff and then not have to worry in the future about plumbing repairs or things malfunctioning. So fi plumbing fixtures were worth the upgrade. Knobs, drawer pulls. Look, if you wanna order all your stuff from Restoration Hardware and Serena and Lily, knock yourself out. I think you're crazy, but that's just me. I feel like there are a lot of great options that you can source yourself from Home Depot, from Lowe's, from Amazon. I got stuff from all three of those places. I personally am very pleased. I think they look beautiful. That is my personal opinion. And even though I film a lot in my bathroom, the only people that are really in there are my immediate family. So I'm not trying to impress anyone but myself. Uh, mirrors, if you don't need a custom size, we needed a custom size. We are talking some seriously huge wall space. If you don't need a custom size, don't have the designer or the contract do your mirror. Just go find pretty mirrors. You can find them at Home Goods. You can find them you know, all like Etsy, Amazon. There's all kinds of great online resources with very inexpensive mirror options. You do not have to buy them from Anthropology. Although if you want to, they make beautiful mirrors. I just, I knew there were less expensive options. And the advice I've gotten from friends who are interior designers is you can source out your own mirrors and get a far better deal than if you go through custom or what have you. So you can save on the mirrors. And cabinets, okay, cabinets are gonna be expensive-ish. Um, not as expensive as countertops, but it's the next highest line item on your budget. But even there, you can save some money. So we opted for non-custom, like just standard, in stock, stock colors, nothing custom about the color. I chose not to go with soft clothes drawers or doors, that adds a whole lot more money. Um, I didn't go with the, there's different levels of door options. I went with the level one. I didn't need anything fancy. I didn't care as much about what the wood was made out of because they were painted wood from the factory. So they're gonna be painted white regardless. So even though cabinets are expensive, there are ways to make them a lot more expensive and there are ways to make them fit your budget a little more. So just some things to look at there. So one of the questions was, what was this most recent experience like compared to the first phase of our remodeling. And I would say that this phase was more frustrating for me personally because I have some control issues. The first job, I was the general contractor, so to speak. I oversaw all the subs. I chose the subs. I coordinated when things got installed. And for me, that worked better for my kind of anxiety control issues. Whereas this situation, I just had to like kind of hand it over to the contractor. You want to know about the tile. How did it work out that we didn't have to retile? We purposefully chose cabinets that have the same exact footprint as the existing cabinets. So I would not have to worry about retiling or adding tile to that area. Plus we added, um, they call it toe kicks or quarter round to the bottom, which um, made it very seamless and if there were any tiny gaps, we're talking like a quarter of an inch or less, that could be caulked or you put the quarter and or the quarter around went over it. So we didn't have to worry about that. We made some very strategic decisions again to save money because in this case, I wasn't sure, we don't have anything left over from the tile from the original renovation. So I wasn't entirely sure we could match it up. So it was important to me to make sure we didn't have to deal with that issue. And then the last question was, any regrets or things that I would do differently? Well, first of all, I know myself now and I know that I could have overseen 
this project on my own and my peace of mind would have been better, but the end result, it's still beautiful. So I'm happy with that. As far as other things, it's more about actually from the first remodel. I don't really have any regrets or things I would do differently in this remodel. So here's the flip side where I'm gonna contradict myself. I made certain mistakes because I wasn't getting advice from someone who had a lot of experience in the design side. So the mistakes that I made, I would have made a bigger niche in the shower um, to put, you know, like shampoo and things like that. I either would have done, I just have one centered. In hindsight, I would have done one long one that basically took up the, almost the whole length of the shower. I know that now. I wish my tile guy had suggested that. For some reason, he did not. I would have also chosen to do a shower head that also had a handheld option because I have a very large shower stall and that that handheld shower head would have been nice for cleaning. And then the third thing that I would have changed is um, my shower door opens outwards. So to get my towel that's hanging, you kind of have to, you know, you basically, to get your towel, you have to get out of the shower and now you're dripping and you're cold. So I wish that it would have opened inwards so I could have just grabbed, wrapped myself in my towel inside. These are small things, but again, if you're working with someone who has experience Hopefully they're going to give you those insights so you don't make mistakes like that. The last thing, I will link the bath tray. I had a few questions about what is that tray in your bathtub, where do I get it? So I'll link that down in the description box. But that's it. That's everything that I can think of to cover our bathroom remodel experience. If there's anything else you can think of that I did not cover here in this very long video, please go ahead and leave your questions down in the comments and I will answer them there. Thanks for hanging out with me today. Thanks for hanging out with me through this whole process. It has been a ton of fun and I will see you in the next video. Bye.